Good morning. Welcome to Gospel Center Missionary Church. Whether you are joining us in person or through our live stream, we are happy to have you this morning. We would love it if you could take a moment to connect with us. If you're here in person, you can do that by grabbing the connect sheet at your table or on the pew seat and fill that out. If you are joining us online, you can go to www.gcmc.info. Go under the Engage tab and hit Connect. And you can give us any prayer requests that you might have, any changes of information. Or if you're new with us, you can tell us a little bit about you because we would love to learn more about who you are. We have children's church programming for our nursery kids, and that is open right now throughout the whole service. And then we have a children's church class for our preschoolers. So if you have a preschooler, they will be released to that class after the pastoral prayer. I am excited to announce that we have our Sunday school classes reopening and kicking off next Sunday. So for children's ministry, we'll have Awana classes for children ages two all the way up to sixth grade. We will also be opening our youth Sunday school classes as well as all of our adult classes and a brand new adult class taught by Pastor Jim and Missy. If you would like to learn more about that class, you can uh, just look in your bulletin and there's more information there. All right, guys, it's been wonderful bringing you the announcements this morning. If you could please stand and we are going to worship our Lord. If you could stand, please, let's worship our Lord. Yeah. 
victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, because there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there's power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. My name is Rob Nyson, and the scripture reading this morning is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, beginning in the 22nd verse. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. You know, uh, if you haven't been paying attention to what's going on in the world, you realize it is falling apart, right? Yeah. We're, as, a, as a matter of fact, I've heard people say that I'm just overcome by the, by the uh, worry and the concern. And that's not biblical. If you're a child of God, that's not biblical. We, we find in 1 John 5, this is, a love for, uh, this is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes in Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. So you are not to be overcome by the world if you know Jesus. You are to overcome the world. And today as we go to God in prayer and seeking God in faith, we can overcome whatever difficulties that are facing you today. And so today as we get ready to go to prayer, if you have a concern, if you're here in the in the sanctuary, if you're listening on home at home, if you have a concern, just share it with God. And the God who created the universe can certainly take care of your problem today. So let's go to God today as overcomers. Let's pray. Today we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you for the faith that you're even the author of faith that allows us to be overcomers. And we know that we can only be overcomers through faith in you. And so we thank you, Lord, for that assurance that no matter what's going on around us, you're bigger than that problem and that you can, through uh, we can uh, overcome through our faith in you. And so we think of the needs we have in our church, in our world. We think of uh, our shut-ins today who would love to be here but can't be here for various reasons. We think especially of Betty Huber. We pray that you would bless her. We pray that you would be with those who are ill today. We think of Kyle's dad, who is, work, who is, who is uh, suffering with bone cancer, and for Ron Applegate, who has a heart problem, and for Bob Richter, who's in the hospital today with pneumonia. We pray that you would bless him. We think of um, Jennifer Sigafus and her nephew, who has been missing, who has been, now been found, but he's passed away. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the family. We pray that you would bless the family of this shooting victim down just a couple blocks from where we are right now. We pray that you would bless the family. We pray that you would just bless in that circumstance and may your perfect will be done. We do thank you, Lord, that, uh, that uh, uh, Bambi is responding well to her chemo treatments. And we pray that you would continue to bless her. We pray that you would be with uh, Pat and, and Jennifer as they've 
lost brothers in recent days. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our country. We know that we like to call ourselves a Christian nation, but a Christian nation has to be made up of Christians. And so I pray, Lord, that we here may have a positive influence on our neighborhoods, on our state, on our region, our country, as we seek you. And we pray that our church would have an impact in this community as we seek to be the light and salt that you've called us to be. We pray, Lord, right now that you would be with those who are caring for our children, those who are serving on the worship team, those who are serving on the tech team. We pray that your hand would be upon them and each, each would be drawn closer and closer to you in their service today. And we pray that you'd be with Pastor John as he comes to share the message in just a moment. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that, pray that you would strengthen him to share your word in the way you've called him to. So we thank you for all you've done for us today. We pray that you would just continue to bless us in every way and help us to be overcomers in the days and weeks ahead. And we'll give you the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. As we turn our hearts back to worship, I um, wanted to spend time reflecting on 2020 and just all the changes that have happened. And uh, one of the changes that's going to be happening here at church is our own J.P. Murray and family are going to be moving to California. Uh, J.P.'s been a part of our church for a long time, and their family has um, just been a wonderful blessing to us. But they feel that God is calling them out into this next phase of life. And isn't that what happens? God oftentimes calls us into the unknown. He calls us to engage in ways that maybe be different or uncomfortable or a big leap of faith all the way across the country. I don't know what God's calling you to this morning, but I can tell you this. God is good. And whatever he's calling you to, wherever he's calling you to, he will be there with you. So will you stand as we worship him this morning and just celebrate his goodness? Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving oh god you're so good god you're so good god you're so good you're so good
But this life brings suffering. Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. Oh God, you're so Lord, we know that whatever you call us into, that you will be with us, that you will lead us, and you will guide us. So we trust you, Lord, to do it again, that which only you can do, and by faith you make real. Jesus, you 
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your Let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray with me the prayer on the screen. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. Amen. We reach down and grab your Bibles, whether that's a printed Bible or a tablet. If you're at home, if you'll take your Bibles there as well and open them to the book of Genesis chapter 2. We've been looking at verses 15 through 17, and today is kind of a standalone sermon, a little more topical on Labor Day weekend uh, regarding work, and starting next Sunday, we'll begin a series uh, looking at the life of Joseph from the Old Testament. But today we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And then you may be seated. Today, God wants to change our perspective on work, to give us a different view of getting up on Monday morning and heading to a job. And it's Labor Day weekend, so it seemed fitting to speak about work. And What we discover about Labor Day weekend is that historically, it came at a time when America was, in some sense, trying to change its perspective on work. I always wonder, what is Labor Day weekend? Why do we have it? Because we have Labor Day, it's called Labor Day, and we all take the day off, or at least a lot of people take the day off. And so you wonder about Labor Day weekend, but Labor Day weekend came in the 1800s, uh, right at the end of the 1800s, in, in fact, in June of 1894. And Labor Day weekend came as a response to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was in the 1800s. You discovered that uh, people, we had grown up in a rural agricultural society where a lot of people worked on farms. Cities were growing, factories were growing, and more and more people were starting to get jobs and to work in factories. As a result, people often worked seven hours a day, 12 hours, um, or seven days a week, 12 hours a day, um, Wages were low, life was difficult, even at times, if if necessary, children were put into labor to work in factories, and we saw the rise of uh, labor unions during the 1800s, and they began. Well, all that reached a culmination in June of 1894 when the railroad workers decided that they had had enough and they were going on strike. And so uh, they decided to strike against the Pullman Rail, railway car company in Chicago, Illinois. And what began as a strike landed up in becoming boycotts, turned into riots, and became somewhat violent. And as a result of that, it, it stopped train traffic throughout the Chicagoland area, but Chicago's in some ways at the center of America. And so it really created a, a shutdown to the train traffic across the United States of America. And so as this began to grow and became more impassioned and more violent, President Grover Cleveland, I believe it was at that time, decided he sent in 12,000 troops to quell the riots and the protesting and all that was going on. And sure enough, the troops showed up, they put an end to it, lives were lost, but it was, it was ended. But six days later, something happened. A piece of paper was put on the president's desk and said, America needs to recognize the work of its common everyday laborers to realize all the value and benefit they bring to the American society and to our culture. And so he was asked to enact what would become a national holiday, Labor Day, recognizing the labor of the American workforce. And so that became a reality. And so still today, we celebrate Labor Day. Well, there was a change taking place in America and the way they viewed work and the way they viewed labor and, and that. There's also a change that needs to take place within the Christian's life. 
and the way that we view labor. And so today, we're going to make some observations. Um, all from the beginning of Genesis, um, prior to the fall when sin uh, messes work up, but to make some observations about God and about work, and then to draw some implications for our lives. So first of all, four observations. The first observation is this, God is a worker. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, a well-known verse, starting off the Bible, if we were to turn back to that, says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And sometimes when we read that verse in Genesis 1, 1, we think, in the beginning, we realize God was there before anything began. And we can talk about the eternal nature of God and how everything started with his command to create. And we can talk about how he created. Theologians like to talk about ex nihilo, out of nothing, God could create the world. But what we might miss is just the practical observation that God is a worker. I don't know if you thought about that, but I think a lot of times we don't imagine God as a worker. I mean, sometimes I think of God as a vacationer. He gets to be up in heaven, everything's peachy, and life is easy, and so it's like the eternal vacation. Or maybe you think of God as the retiree. Sure, he worked. There was day one, two, three, four, five, six of creation. Then day seven, he rested. And God's just had it easy ever since, resting. Sometimes I think we tend to think of God as more like a genie. Sure, he has work to do, but he can just snap his fingers. He can just say the word, and it just happens. Like I was watching the, our neighbors were showing out in their front yard on a screen they had put together uh, Aladdin, the new live adventure of Aladdin, Disney's Aladdin. And so the, the genie played by Will Smith, you know, he can just snap his fingers and make it happen. Sometimes we think God's got it easy, but we often don't think about God as a worker. Some of you are old enough to remember uh, a Christian musician who tragically passed away in the 1990s. Um, his name was Rich Mullins. And Rich Mullins, uh, one of his most popular songs that he recorded was a song called Our God is an Awesome God. See, some of you knew that. And um, so our God is an awesome God. The first line of the first verse is interesting. It says, when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. And I heard an interview with him once uh, uh, talking about that. And he, and he said, he said, God isn't up there just trying to show off his power uh, to the world. God rolls up his sleeves because when you roll up your sleeves, it's what do you got to do? It means you're about to get dirty because you, you got work to do. He says, God's a worker. And we discover in Genesis at the beginning, before we can talk about work ourselves and the own work that we do, we have to realize that the God we worship and the God we serve is a worker. And it's not just that he worked in the past, he is working. In fact, there's a, a book um, by Robert Banks entitled Faith Goes to Work in which he highlights multiple ways God is at work. Not only does he mention God works in creation, fashioning the physical and the human world. In fact, it's kind of interesting to think. Sometimes we think, well, God's done creating. But actually, just, this is just a side note. You get this as bonus in the second service. Didn't think of it in the first to throw in there. But um, I, just a side note, um, theologians are, are not sure where the human soul comes from. Did God give humanity the ability to create not only the body between um, a husband and a wife, uh, to create the body of their children, but also their soul, so that both come from the parents? Or does God still create a soul every single time a human being comes into existence? And so um, Christians take both views. I don't know which one's right or wrong. I don't even know how to solve that debate. But it's interesting, interesting to think God may still be creating every moment um, a new person, a child is conceived. And just to think about God is still creating. But he goes on to say, but God's doing other things. He's doing the work of redemption, saving and reconciling people and creation. He's doing the work of providence where he's sustaining humans and the world and holding all of it together. He's doing the work of justice and maintaining justice within the world. And the work of compassion, including comforting, healing, guiding, and shepherding people. And he does the work of revelation, re revelation being revealing truth and enlightening people with truth. God is a worker. And so I know most of us, we hope to get out of work, but we have to realize that when we show up at church, the God we showed up to worship is a worker. He rolls up his sleeves and he has work to do. The second observation is this, that not only is God a worker, but when God works, his work is good. 
You might think, well, obviously, but Genesis highlights that. Genesis, uh, if we were back in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. It was good. In Genesis 1, 31, at the end of the days of creation, it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It was very good. And all of a sudden, we see that God's work is good. Now, there's two ways it's good. The one that I often think of is kind of like what kids get on, when they get a smiley face sticker on a you know, homework or a coloring sheet they had to take home in kindergarten or first grade. Kind of like you did a good job. And you know, it's kind of the, uh, the award you get for an achievement award. In other words, God looked at what he did and he said, I did a good job. I made light and light was good. You know, I made the heavens and the earth, the stars, the planets, they're good. This is amazing. Good job. But what's interesting is I studied this week, one Old Testament scholar said this. He said, that's true. Everything God did, he made it good in its form. You could look at it and say, that's a good job. But he said, but he also made it good in its function, what it does. Old Testament scholar John Salehammer states, the good that Genesis has in view has a specific range of meaning in chapter 1. The good is that which is beneficial for humanity. Throughout this opening chapter, God is depicted as the one who both knows what is good for humankind and is intent on providing that good for humanity. In other words, God doesn't just look at his creation and say, boy, I did a good job. He looks at it and says, it's good because it's going to be a blessing to other people. It's good both in its form and in its function, in, in its blessing to others. Now, I don't know if this will help illustrate it, but um, my wife and I are we're taking out our pink bathroom from 1961 and turning it to a white bathroom. And in the process of changing this bathroom that's been pink with a pink tub, pink tile, pink sink, and pink toilet, uh, we decided that the room needed a window. It had had a window when the house was built in 1961. We can tell that by the studs and because... There's every other house in the neighborhood that's designed just like ours has a window. But they did an addition at some point on our house, and they covered over the one window in the bathroom. So when you're in the bathroom, it's like being in a cave. There's just no natural light in there. And we decided, wouldn't it be nice if there was a small window? So we put a small window. Now, to be honest, you might say the window's not a good window because we went out and bought the absolute cheapest window there was. It's like a $50 window. Maybe it was $60. Um, But it, it didn't cost very much. But it's amazing in function because all of a sudden now when you open the bathroom door and you look in there, there's light. And just you look at what the window does. And you're like, it's amazing. Have any of you ever had that experience where all of a sudden you're like, oh, you open the curtains or all of a sudden somebody puts a window in, into a room and you're just like, natural light makes all the difference in the world sometimes, doesn't it? To, to brighten the place up. And that's the function. It, it, it cheers the entire room and brightens the entire room. God looks at his creation and he says, in its form it's good. Yes, he made it well. He did a good job on it. But he's really looking at it when he says it's good. And he says, it's good in its function. What I have created will be a blessing to the flourishing of humanity. And so God's work is good. We'll need to remember that when we get to the end and we start talking about implications for our lives. Observation number three is this. God shares his work with us. God shares his work with us. Now, I'm not talking about how I share my work with my children. For example, I'm like, oh, the yard needs mowing. Son, would you go mow the yard? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the the idea of God invites us to be his partners, his co-laborers with what he's doing in the world. So a real quick quiz um, on some famous partnerships in American business history. Uh, Don't worry, you don't get graded, and um, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but you can take a stab at it. So tell me this, what company did this partnership form? The partnership of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Apple Computers. What about the partnership of Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield? Yeah, did you catch the first names, the partnership? I'll leave the last names off. Ben and Jerry. Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yep. What about the partnership of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger? I hear a few of you out there that know it. You see some of their signs, especially on commercial properties that are for sale? Brookshire Hathaway. All right, I think you can all get this one if you listen to the names. The partnership of William Proctor and James Gamble. 
Procter & Gamble. All right, last one for extra credit, the partnership of Henry Wells and William Fargo. Wells Fargo, that's great, but that's not the extra credit part. The extra credit part is can you name the second company that they partnered to form? Wells Fargo is the first, there's a second. American Express. Wells Fargo and American Express were their partnerships. But the greatest partnership in history isn't between two business people. The greatest partnership in history is between God and humanity. In fact, John Stott writes this on this passage. He says, God deliberately humbled himself to need Adam's cooperation. Of course, he could have done all the work himself. After all, he had planted the garden. So presumably, he could have managed it too, but he chose not to. God invites us to share in his work. Indeed, our work becomes a privilege when we see it as a collaboration with God. And that's what we see on this third point in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 that we read at the beginning of the sermon. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. God shares his work with humanity. He says he could do it on his own, but he says let's be partners in this and co-laborers together. And then observation number four is this. Our work should be worship. Our work should be worship. Again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now, I don't have a garden. Some of you do have a garden. You know what it is to work and to take care of a garden, to plant it, to water it, to weed it, to, you know, uh, to rototill the soil, um, when, when you need to do that, and you know what it is to take care of a garden. For me, I just have a yard. So yesterday, I, I opened the garage, I got the mower out, filled it with gas, pulled the string, and up and down I went on the yard, back and forth, mowed it. And then when I was done with that, I was like, oh, I really should weed whack. I try to avoid that because I don't like weed whacking. And, uh, but I got the, the weed whacker out, and mine's gasoline powered, so I made sure it, gas and oil mixed together in there. And then you got to go through all the steps, pump the prime five to seven times, then move, it to le move the lever to number one, then pull the string five to seven times, then move it to lever two, then pull until it starts, then wait for 35 seconds, then move it to position three, now you're ready to go. And um, allowed us weed whacker on the block, everybody else has electric ones now, and I bought a gas one, because when I lived in the country, I needed to go a long ways. And so I got this loud gas one, and that's what it means to, in my world, to be in a garden, to work it, and to take care of it. But what's interesting and I didn't know this before just wanting to preach on work this week, and I want to expect you to know this, but all the Old Testament scholars tell us this, and they all agree on this, that the Hebrew words there for work it and take care of it are the same Hebrew words used in Leviticus and Numbers to describe the, the responsibility of the priest in the temple and the tabernacle. It's the same words. And they said it makes sense because when you think about priests in the tabernacle and the work that they're doing in the tabernacle, said the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of who is? God, right? They would go there. That's where the high priest could go once a year to meet with God. And so the responsibility is they had to meet with God. Said, so now we go to Genesis and what we often tend to miss is that the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden, but who walks there in the cool of the day? God. And so what we discover in Genesis 1 is that mankind has a royal role because we're made in God's image and are to have dominion over the earth. Those are royal terms, kingly terms. But here we discover that mankind has a priestly role, and that is in our work to do it as worship unto the Lord. Our work is worship. The caring for the garden, the taking care of it, and the protecting of it are all part of worship. And so the point is simply this, good work, and good meaning good as Genesis defines good for the flourishing of humanity, good work should be godly worship. Good work should be godly worship. Now you may ask yourself, how can work be godly worship? How can that be? Well, three suggestions here to help us in that direction. The first is this, to have a biblical attitude towards work. Now, I'll admit, work's not always fun. In fact, many times it may not be fun. And what you discover in the story 
of Scripture is that while God created work and work is a good thing, you get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, and you discover Adam and Eve have sinned, they disobey God, so God, in punishment, comes and pronounces a curse. And part of that curse is by the sweat of your brow will you eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And what we discover is that work isn't easy anymore. But understand this, work isn't what's bad. It's the curse on our sin that has made work difficult and hard. And so is there work that's no fun? Absolutely. And is work difficult? Yes. Does it wear us out? It does. And is there work that is in the world where people are treated unjustly and unkindly and jobs that are just horrendous? Absolutely. So I don't mean to say in any way that all work is pleasant and good and we should just smile and cheer about it. No, because all of work has been stained by sin. But the problem is sometimes we as God's people, then we want to say, well, work's just a bad thing. I can't wait to retire. I can't wait till I can prop my feet up, till I can go on a vacation. I wish I never had to come back. But we have to realize this. Work, we have to change our attitude, is ultimately good. It's the curse of sin that's bad. Work is a good thing. And we need a new attitude about work. And oftentimes, just practically in our jobs, a new attitude about work. There's a story told by Tony Campolo, kind of a parable, in which he talked about um, a factory, and they were hiring employees, and they hired one of the employees that they hired showed up for his first day at work, and he went through the first two and a half hours of the work day, and the bell rang, and everybody went on their 10-minute break. And so he was on his 10-minute break, and he walked up to the foreman, and he said, all right, Mr. Foreman, he said, I got a question for you. He said, tell me, I'm brand new here. What do I expect? Is this a good place to work or not? And the foreman looked at him and he said, well, he said, before I answer that, tell me this. He said, how was your last job? Was it a good place to work or was it not? And the guy said, oh, my last place to work, it was terrible. It was one of the worst places you could imagine. He said, the people I worked with were rotten. He said, the management didn't care about anybody. The salaries were so subpar that they didn't show any value to any employees. He said, it was atrocious, it was dirty. He said it was just a rotten place to work. And the foreman looked at him and he said, well, I can tell you this. He said, unfortunately, you're probably going to find that working here at this factory is much like that factory, that the employees are rotten to work with, that management doesn't care, that wages are subpar. And he said, you're probably, you're probably going to hate it working here. And I hate to tell you that. That's probably the way it's going to be. Well, a few weeks later, the, as the company continued to grow and to hire more employees, they had hired another employee. And Sure enough, he showed up for his first day at work, and after the first two and a half hours, the bell rang, and he went on his 10-minute break, and he walked up to the foreman, and he said, so, Mr. Foreman, he said, I got a question for you. He said, I'm just curious, how is it working here? And the foreman looked at him, and he said, well, let me ask you before I answer that. He said, how was it at your last job? And the guy said, oh, my last job was awesome. He said, in fact, I really debated whether I should leave it. He said, but this job just seemed like a better opportunity for me and better wages. He said, but I love the people I work with. They were friendly, encouraging, and they were warm and inviting. He said, the management was wonderful. They cared about the people. He said, the paychecks, I, I, you wish they were larger, but you knew that the company cared about its employees and were trying to take care of them. He said, it was a great place to look, work. He said, do I have any chance of that being true here? And the foreman looked at him and said, you know what? He said, I think you're going to find that this place to work is just like the place where you worked, where the, the employees here are warm and inviting, they're wonderful to work with, management cares about its people, and the pay, it may not be the top in the world, he said, but, but you can tell that they care about their employees. He said, that's great. You know what made all the difference? Same place. Their attitude. And we need a new attitude when it comes to work, a biblical attitude, realizing work's not, work is a four-letter word but it's not a bad thing. Work's a good thing. It's a gift from God to partner with him. It is the curse of sin that makes it hard. And so we need, first off, a new attitude. Secondly, we need to realize that if we are going to see our good work as worship, we need biblical discernment regarding work. We need to discern what is good work and the implication is, is some things are good. That means some things are not good. They're bad. We need to be able to discern the difference between what is good and bad. Because in Genesis chapter 1, what, when God looked at his creation and said it was good, as the Old Testament scholar explained to us, that what that meant was it was for the benefit of human flourishing. And so what that means for us is that good work, good jobs, the jobs that you should apply for 
and seek out are jobs that should be good for your fellow humanity. And that's good. But the implication is this, that there are jobs that you can take. There are jobs that will pay you a paycheck. They might even pay you a big paycheck. But they are not beneficial to your fellow human beings. And they hurt them. So let me use an example. It's an example that I don't expect you to necessarily agree with, but it will illustrate the point. Um, in the missionary church, if you don't know the history of the missionary church, we come out of uh, the Mennonite background over in Elkhart County. Um, we came r- right out of the Mennonite church, and so if you go back gen- enough generations, you discover a, a strong Mennonite influence. And it used to be true of the missionary church, this isn't true anymore, but like the Mennonites, uh, even to this day, do, do you know that the Mennonites are, are, maybe the term, they're not, pacifists wouldn't be the right term, but, but they support nonviolence. Would you know that about the Mennonites? Their background, they'd be nonviolence. And so uh, the missionary church today, even though that's our, our background, the missionary church today has its members serving in all positions of the armed forces. It has people serving in the police. Uh, you know, it has chaplains in the military. And so uh, the missionary church, while it encourages people to be very thoughtful of that, realizing that um, if God's called you to serve in the military, part of the responsibility might involve the taking of a life of another person. And, and so we, we, we view it soberly, but we believe that God goes call some people to that. But the Mennonite background, they don't support anything that is in regard to violence. So here's where it gets applicable. I remember when I started in pastoring, the missionary church, um, a lot of its investments, uh, the plans for retirement, plans for insurance, all of that stuff tended to be in partnership with Mennonite groups um, over in the Goshen, Elkhart area. And what was interesting, I remember talking to a financial planner one day, you know, trying to figure out what do you do about retirement. And I asked, well, what do you invest in? And he said, well, we're going to try to avoid a lot of things that um, evangelicals would avoid investing in. In other words, we don't avoid in any casinos or gambling. He said, we don't avoid uh, invest in anything that is, um, that is illegal. He said, but as with our Mennonite background, he said, you need to know we don't invest in anything that makes weaponry for the military, for the police, for anything. He said, we, we, we will not invest in anything that makes any type of weapon whatsoever because of our nonviolent background. And so I realized something. They believe that a weapon is not fit for human flourishing. And so they refuse to invest in it, to partake of it, to work at it, to put their money into it. Now, we may not have the same stand regarding that issue but we should have the same conviction in our own heart that if there is a business or there is a job that doesn't lead to human flourishing, then we should say that I'm not taking it. I'm not putting my application in there. I won't work for that company if they're doing something that ultimately harms my neighbor. And I don't know if we often ask ourselves that. Are we doing jobs that are for the benefit of humanity? In fact, What's interesting, have you ever asked yourself, whether maybe you're retired and you look back on your job or or you're working right now, how is your job a partnership with what God is doing in the world and blessing humanity? So in other words, that list that was from the book, that list of things God's doing, God is redeeming. Is your job part of like pastors, evangelists, but also artists, novelists, filmmakers? When they tell stories or they make art that is redemptive in its nature, they partner with God in his redemption of the world. Or take God as our creator. That means sculptors, actors, painters, musicians, poets, potters, weavers, seamstresses, metal workers, even carpenters and fashion designers and architects who design buildings, all are a part of God's creative work in the world when they do it for the sake of human flourishing. Or take God's providence over the world and his care of it. The bureaucrats, the utility workers, the policymakers, the counselors, the farmers, the firemen, the IT specialists, the bankers, the mechanics, the engineers, the the machinists, the janitors, all of them working for the maintenance and the care of human flourishing. Or take justice, judges, lawyers, paralegals, prison wardens, police officers, standing for justice in the world, or compassion, doctors, nurses, paramedics, psychologists, therapists, welfare agents, all working in the compassion of God. Or the issue of revelation, God's revealing his truth, preachers and scientists. Funny that those two get put together as our world tries to take them apart, but they were both pointing the truth. There's no conflict between a preacher and a scientist. Both pointing the truth. 
and educators and journalists and scholars and writers trying to reveal truth and to let hum humanity know what is true and what is right. God is at work in the world. We should choose jobs that partner with his blessing of humanity. And when we see things, and maybe that's a question worth asking today when you eat lunch, what type of jobs, what type of jobs undermine the flourishing of humanity? What type of jobs should we as Christians therefore avoid? You can discuss that when you eat lunch today. But then that brings me to our last suggestion here. We need discernment regarding what type of jobs we work. Finally, we need a biblical integrity within work. Now, I use this word integrity. Sometimes we use integrity to mean honesty, and we should absolutely be honest in our work, but that's a different sermon. Um, another way to use integrity is that it is an integral whole. It is about wholeness. It is oneness. And oftentimes, I think Christians create a dividing line when they think about work. They're like, pastors have a sacred job to do, and everybody else has a secular job to do. Or maybe the worship pastor, and maybe the Sunday school teachers, or the associate pastors, or maybe those, uh, the office administrator at church, they have sacred jobs, but the rest of us work in the secular marketplace. And God comes to us today and he says, hogwash. Every job is to be an act of worship before him. Every job can be offered in worship to God. And so there's a monk by the name of Brother Lawrence he said this, he said, the hours spent in the monastery praying is no different for me than the hours spent washing dishes of the other monks. He said, because I do both for the glory of God and I do both in the presence of God. Your job is sacred. And I think a lot of times people, they assume, well, the pastor's got a high calling. Your job is your calling. Your job is your calling. God has put you there and placed you there, just like Esther, for such a time as this, to do your work. And it is no lower a calling than a pastor or a missionary or a Bible teacher or anything else. Your job is your calling and is just as much reward and greatness before God Almighty as any church job there is. Don't create a dividing line between the sacred and the secular. Every job can be an act of worship. And so, the point is simply this. Good work, hopefully your good work, should be godly worship. Good work should be godly worship. You partner with God in what he's doing in the world and recognize his presence in it. So, to wrap it up, maybe Christians should have a different perspective of work. And um, I'll leave you with one thought here at the end. And that is, any of you are, see the classic movie, I, the first service made sure I knew this, that this movie is the first animated musical full-length movie produced by Disney. Anybody know what it is? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. If I'm wrong, you can correct me. I have no, it won't, it won't hurt my feelings at all, but, but I'm told Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, not the first animation. They, I had Mickey Mouse and different things before that, but the first, you know, full-length motion musical animated movie by Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. How many of you have seen Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Lots of you. So it's an old classic movie by Disney. I remember the first time I saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It is a very vivid memory in my day. And if my mom and dad are watching on live stream this morning, as they often are, I am sure my mom remembers the... Uh, the day we went to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, because they had re-released it in the 1980s. I must have been about six years old, and um, there, because I don't believe my brother Greg had been born yet, and so uh, my mom had come up with a plan that on an afternoon in the middle of summertime, we were going to go to Green Acres Plaza, about three-quarters of a mile from our house, their little two-screen cinema, and we were going to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I remember it fondly, because that morning I went over to a friend's house, uh, and I had told Tom that... Um, that I was going to go see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And Tom's mom got on the phone and said, hey, can Tom come along? And my mom had planned that as a special day for just my sister and I. And do you ever have that? Some of you parents, kids don't understand this, but as parents, do you ever understand when you want to just do something with your kids and you don't want to have to be in charge of other people's children? Does that make sense? At least for some of you, that makes sense. And for some of you, if you 
have children in the future, that will sometimes make sense. And uh, so that was one of those days. My mom had planned this special. It was for my sister and I, and all of a sudden called up. And she didn't feel like she could say no. So I got home from playing with Tom. He was going to come over three hours later to go to the movie theater with us. And my mom was furious. She was very upset that I had said anything. And it really, really wasn't upset that I had said anything. She was just upset that now she had to take a friend along. And uh, so we went there. And I remember being in a great deal of trouble that day. And uh, we went to the movie theater. We picked up Tom on the way to the movie theater. And halfway through the movie, it became even more eventful because my sister began vomiting. At which point, my mom was happy that Tom was there because she would not have left me a six-year-old in the theater alone, but she felt she could, it's a little tiny theater, she felt she could step out to the bathroom taking care of my sister and leave me and Tom together to watch Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And so we watched it. And in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, there's a song and I suspect many of you have heard the song. I don't remember much of the movie. I remember being in trouble that day for Tom coming. I remember my sister throwing up. And um, that's my vivid memory of that day. But I do remember a song. Hi-ho, hi-ho. Off to work we go. You know what? Christians, I realize our jobs can be messed up by sin. So I say this understandingly. But Christians should be people who realize that ultimately work is something to sing about. It is a blessing from God. I mean, all you have to do is have COVID come through and everybody gets stuck at home and people are wishing they had a job or they're wishing they could go back to their jobs. Or have you ever been sick long enough that you couldn't do anything and they said, you know, stay off your feet for the next four weeks and you were just wishing you could be back up on your feet doing something. Because ultimately, work is God's gift to us because it's an invitation from the God of heaven to participate in what he is doing in the world for the benefit and the blessing of humanity. And so work is a good thing. And when we start not just to do it the right way, we should do it for God, yes. But in this moment, what I want you to realize is that when you work, you should recognize the presence of God already in it and do it with him and for his glory. He is already at work in the world, and you are partnering with him. And so when you get up on a Monday morning, I know you may not feel like it. I know you might feel like dragging. In fact, I have to confess, pastors on Monday mornings, it's just kind of like, ugh. It's like, I have to do it again. I've got to come up with another sermon for the next Sunday. And I've got six days now left to figure out what I'm going to say. And so I understand that. But at the same time, of anybody in the entire world, Christians should be the ones who get up on a Monday morning and they realize, yeah, work is messed up because of sin, but ultimately it's God's gift to us and we can sing hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. And we should be the ones, you know the first service did that too, they whistled at the end of it. Thank you. We should be the ones with a song in our heart, understanding that God has invited us to partner with him. And it won't be easy because of sin, but what a gift God has given us to partner with him in his work in the world. Amen? Amen. So I pray you have a song in your heart as you go to work. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for the gift of work. And Lord, I do pray for those for whom work is, uh, work is a battlefield because of sin. And Lord, we recognize that today. We don't want to make light of that. And Lord, we know there are those who are just looking for work and they're praying for employment. But Lord, we also see in your word that ultimately work in and of itself is a good thing. It's something you do, and you've done it well and are doing it, and you invite us to participate. And I pray for every person here, whether it's clocking in at a job or whether it's just the work around the house and keeping things straight there, whether it's the work of balancing the checkbook or paying bills, Lord, that we might see your presence in it. And like Brother Lawrence of centuries ago, we might say, I do it for God, and I do it with God. And may we be blessed in our work. So thanks for the invitation, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Will you stand as we sing?
stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working the benediction this morning. May the favor of the Lord God rest upon you. May he establish the work of your hands. Yes, establish the work of your hands. Amen? Amen. Enjoy Labor Day off and a blessed week at work of week after that. Ha! Uh-huh.